For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd, privileged to talk with Dr. Wes Stafford, the president and CEO of Compassion International and the author of Just a Minute. Wes, great to talk with you today. Well, thanks, Wayne. It's, uh, it's good to be with you. Now, most people know all about Compassion International, but for the few who may not, just give us a brief uh, view of what you do through Compassion. Yeah, Compassion is a ministry that is now 60 years old, absolutely focused on children, children in poverty, uh, helping churches in their communities minister to uh, to them. So we have a little over a million children now in the program. Uh, we've been at this for 60 years, so we have about 2 million who have graduated from the program. They are pastors and teachers and doctors and nurses, uh, children of the very poor, given a chance to really reach their full God-given potential. And the thing about Compassion is every one of those kids was linked to some sponsor somewhere, someone kind of like the Good Samaritan in the in the story Jesus told, someone who said, you know, you take care of this little one for me, uh, but I'll, I'll pay the bills. And that's uh, that's how Compassion has operated for 60 years. It has to be amazing to stand back and watch that happen. It is absolutely stunning. I've been here for 34 years now. <laughs> so I have watched an entire generation grow up from poverty uh, to be the absolute fabric of their societies across the world. So wow. I know this works. And you've seen kids all over the world really just take a step forward in faith and in education and many other ways because oh, of compassion. Absolutely. I mean, we've got kids who are serving in the parliament of Uganda. We've got senators in Haiti. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, when you're around long enough, you get to see what works and what doesn't <laughs> work. And it, this has been a thrill. It's a fantastic story. Well, we're here to talk about Just a Minute, and this is not the first time I've told you this, but your earlier book, Too Small to Ignore, is on my short list of favorite books of all time. Oh, thanks, Wayne. I, I, I just pulled it out again today, and I looked at some of the things I underlined, and one of the things I underlined was this sentence, Every child you encounter is a divine appointment. With each one, you have the power and opportunity to build the child up or tear the child down. That really is the... Uh, the justification for this new book, isn't it? Just a minute. You know, this this second book was born out of that first book. And I wrote that. Um, but, you know, during the five years between books, as I have been out speaking, uh, really promoting children and promoting that book, uh, I have watched when I've gotten to that point uh, that the spirit of a child is like wet cement, that it doesn't take much effort at all to make an impression that can last a lifetime. And sometimes I'll say to the audience, so who, who was it that believed in you before you believed in yourself? Who had that moment with you? What did they say? What did they do? And it's amazing, Wayne. I've watched, uh, I've watched the audience absolutely change. All of a sudden, their eyes are looking off in the distance, and they've all become little boys and girls again. <laughs> and I've come to learn that almost everybody has a story. In fact, I would say everybody has a story, if they'll dig deep enough, mm-hmm. of a moment that their their life launched. You know, Graham Greene, great author, wrote this, and this is, this is the essence of the book beyond what you just said. He wrote this, there's always one moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. Oh, boy. And I'm like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. So I had enough people tell me their stories about their minute over these years that I realized, you know what, this, this needs to be written as a book. And I need to get people to think through their lives, uh, think back, uh, who do you owe for who you are today? And what I'm trying to start is a wave of gratitude. I want people to say, uh, yeah, I remember who that is. I remember what they said, what they did, what I've done with it in my life. And nowadays, you know, you can Google these people. You can find them. And I'm trying to start a wave of gratitude where people will contact and say, you know what, you may not even remember me in your third grade class, uh, but you did this, and I've built my life off of it. You know, I follow your tweets. Uh, by the way, we wouldn't <laughs> yeah. have known what that meant 20 years ago, would we, <laughs> that I follow your <laughs> tweets? But, uh, <laughs> no. but no, uh, right. I, I follow you online, and it was fun to follow you during the writing of this book because uh, this book, I mean, it, it found you, didn't it? It really, really did. It ha- these, these stories had to be told. You know what it is? It's, it's 68 stories. Some of them are people who've told it straight to me. Some of them are stories that I've heard about other people. Uh, some of them are uh, are world leaders like uh, like Colin Powell, uh, Hitler, for Pete's sake. Not every message is a is an uplifting uh, uh, positive. Sure, but message. they make us think, yeah. But in one minute, you can also destroy the life of a child. And if you understand, and, and I tell the story in the book, if you understand what Hitler went through when he was eleven years old, 
you know, it doesn't excuse the atrocities, but it explains a little bit of why would a man be so determined never to be looked down on? Why would he never be willing to be laughed at? Why would he go to any length to uh, to still those who are, are giving him any kind of trouble? Wes, your own story is well known, and God has given you such a tender heart because of your story towards children. But how did you change simply through writing this book? Yeah. Well, you know, it just uh, it, it it affirmed. You know, I, I told my story in uh, Too Small to Ignore, the first book, and people actually should read that one as a kind of a pre <laughs> a I agree. prequel to yeah. this one. Um, uh, that was a very, very hard thing to do. But I, I can tell by looking at my life, and I told much of it in that book, uh, of individual moments that launched me. I mean, I, I maintain that I am a champion for children, that I live with this level of passion, that I lead this size of an organization for children. And you can trace it back to really one moment. And in, in my case, it was that one moment with a birthday candle in my hands where I was with so much rage and so much anger that rather than lose one more time, I was willing to stand there and let that candle burn me. Uh, you could take my life, and it's either before the candle or after the candle, but that was a pivotal moment that identified for me my life is to champion the cause of children, to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. And this book has given me uh, a real sense of, you know, Wes, you've, you've actually done this yet again. You have put in people's hands the tool that maybe they will be inspired to to use the moments that a child stands in front of them to launch the life of a child. And I'm hoping that there will be millions of children who are blessed as a result of people reading this book and saying, you know, I was given a whole lot. Maybe I ought to be alert to the children around me and bless them as well. It's amazing, isn't it, that so much can turn on a single pivot point. Exactly. You know, if we live, if we live our full uh, three score in 10 years, uh, we live 36 million minutes. Uh, childhood that takes us up to age 18 is about nine and a half million minutes. Hmm. But uh, only usually about a half, of, half a dozen of those minutes actually stand out as pivotal in our path. And I've heard enough stories to realize that um, you just might be the one there at the right time, but that fork in the road saying the right thing, you never know when you're making a lifelong memory. Mm-hmm. You've organized this book in an interesting way. You've got these seven sections, and we'll let the book uh, speak for itself in this audiobook edition. But uh, talk about how you came about uh, this organizational way of handling this. Well, you know, I, I started off just gathering stories. Whenever I would sit with people at a banquet table or something, I would explain the basic concept as we just have, and then say, so what's, uh, what's your story? And people would you know, they immediately begin to tell me their stories. And so I just gathered them at random. Uh, but once I uh, decided this better, this better be presented in a book, I began to organize them uh, topically around, uh, you know, the moment a child was awakened spiritually, or the moment a, a child's life was saved that changed everything, or the moment values were instored, uh, were instilled in a child's life, or the moment they got their vocational calling. Uh, and so I organized them around just the kind of topics that might explain uh, how can those minutes uh, be utilized to, to direct a child's life. Mm-hmm. As you say, a moment for rescue, to build self-worth, to form character, discover talent, awaken the spirit, and stretch the mind and realize one's calling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there are stories after story uh, in uh, in each of those sections that you've you got to break out the tissue box. Uh, for this yeah, one. you do. <laughs> I had to. I had to writing it. You know, it, it's it's a, it's an easy read for those who haven't read it. Um, but it's uh, it's kind of like chicken soup for the soul with a purpose. Right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's not just heartwarming, yeah. but all of it pivots around. Be grateful for what was done for you and pass it on. Yeah. Well, your heart rings loud and clear for kids, and we sure appreciate that. But I'd I'd also like to get to know you. Uh, now, you've traveled the world all these years on behalf of Compassion, but w- what what brings enjoyment to your own soul beyond the ministry part of it? What do you do to relax, and what goes on at home for West Stafford? Oh, well. <laughs> I, know you, I know you ride motorcycles, you hunt. I do. If, if, you, if it can be done outdoors, I basically do it. I, you know, I work really, really hard, and I'm passionate about my calling, but I also play really, really hard. So I live on a little ranch 
right outside Colorado Springs. You know, I run a few head of cattle on there. I get up in the morning and make sure the fence is up and the and the ice is broken and the uh, the salt licks are in place. And uh, and I uh, yeah, I hunt, I fish, I ride motorcycle, I play racquetball. Uh, I love to hike through the hills. Uh, I, uh, I, I got that little ranch probably about 20 years ago, basically to, to bless my two daughters, Jenny and Katie. Uh, I didn't want them growing up in the suburbia and hanging out at the mall. <laughs> so I wanted them to have some responsibilities, taking care of animals and things, you know? So we got them into 4-H and we got them horse riding lessons and, and such. Turns out, um, I was, I ended up doing more for myself than I did for them. Uh, cause it is an absolute little oasis for me. I can come back from, I don't know, the slums of Bangladesh or India or the jungles of Brazil. And I have this little 35 acre oasis, which is, uh, which is where I live. You have to have that, that, uh, that therapy almost, don't you? I didn't know that I did, but I actually did. Mm-hmm. And my girls have grown up to be compassionate, caring girls. You know, one of the things I work far harder at being a good father than I ever have at being a good president for compassion. <laughs> That's important. Donna and I, my wife of 32 years now, uh, we promised each other before the girls were even born, knowing that I was going to throw myself into compassion's ministry. We promised ourselves that if God ever gave us children, we would love them, and never would we ever hear them legitimately say, well, you cared about all the other kids in the world, but you forgot us. Yeah, we've heard that story in the past, haven't it's, we? So it's the most tragic story, and it often happens in ministry, by right, the way. Right. So here I have two daughters, 29 and 24 now, who uh, I am still their favorite toy. They would rather talk on the phone to me or do something with me than anyone else. And uh, that's the return of having invested so deeply in them. And I bet they have the same heart for kids that you do. They do. The very first money they ever made, uh, they sponsored kids on their own. So I've got one daughter who uh, is a music teacher, Katie, in uh, in Minnesota. She teaches and directs the fourth grade band in a little town there in Minnesota. The other one is uh, living in Manhattan, and she is turned into an actress, a, a writer for uh, music theater. Uh, she's a she's a teacher at the Metropolitan Opera Guild, for Pete's sake. I'm like, really? I raised you on a ranch, and now you live in a tiny little apartment in New York City. You just never know, do you? You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be prouder. And, uh, you know, God has entrusted 1.3 million children to me. Yeah. But those two were handed to me specifically, and I have poured my heart into yeah. them. But 1.3 million, uh, I can't imagine you going out and visiting these countries and seeing just a mass of kids. You see them as individuals, don't you? Absolutely. Well, they are located in 5,500 little church projects. So if you see them at all, you see them in groups of two and 300. Uh, but boy, I'll tell you what, when you sit on the little log bench beside them and you, you feel five little kids holding your right hand and five holding your left hand, and I feel them tap my Mickey Mouse watch because everybody knows Mickey, um, I realize, you know what, it's one child at a time. Mm-hmm. And every time I look into the face of a child, I wonder, so what was God thinking when he knit them in their mama's womb? What is the path ahead of them? What could they become if they're just given a chance? And I consider myself, you know, probably the most blessed guy on the planet mm-hmm. to get to do what I do. How does compassion work in these countries? Do you, do you work with churches, through churches, alongside churches? Through churches, that's the only way we touch the life of a child is through a local body of believers, uh, people who gather uh, for worship in, in the in the town. And uh, if you go out and see our work, you don't see compassion signs over the churches or on our vehicles. Uh, if anybody's going to get thanked, we want it to be that local group of uh, of Christians uh, and that local pastor, and and for the community to eventually say, why is it you care so much about our children? And then they are given the right to not only live out the gospel, but now speak it as well. How do you encounter such needs as you travel and see in the faces of these kids and see the living conditions and yet stay so positive? Well, you know, I think if I was a banker or if I ran a factory and I was traveling into these countries, I would be overwhelmed by just the sheer magnitude of the problem. But I've been for 34 years addressing the problem uh, in a strategy that I see works. And so uh, my joy comes from uh, every time I meet one of our two million graduates and I hear what they're doing and how they're walking with the Lord and how they're blessing their community. When some of them become, you know, senators, uh, 
I uh, my, my heart just overwhelms with joy. I think that God has entrusted to me a very precious ministry that I think is right at the center of his heart and in the sweet spot of what's important in his kingdom. Someone's thinking, yeah, it'd be easy to, uh, in one sense, to go out and find a, a child in need in another country, but sometimes they're right around the corner next door. Exactly, and that's uh, you know, the point I make in this book is uh, the very next child you encounter they might be in a grocery line in front of you. Uh, they might be in the car next to you at the stoplight. Uh, they might be in, a, in your Sunday school class. They may be walking through your church halls with a little Sunday school paper that they just colored. Uh, the child right in front of you, even, even if all you have is 60 seconds, is your divine appointment. Look for anything you can do. A well-timed hug, a well-timed little prayer, a pat on the head, a compliment. Uh, Sometimes that creates a memory that will last uh, until they grow up and they're rocking in a rocking chair as a senior citizen. If we only knew. uh, If uh, we. uh, You talk about uh, people, everybody having their own story. That was my story. I was a kid in a Sunday school, you know, without parents who were very supportive about me going to church. And yet it was was people in that church that put their arms around me and encouraged me. And uh, I know that very well, and I know the power of that. And you can, I know a pastor recently who told me the story that, uh, when he was a little boy, there was an old man in his church that, uh, at the end of church, used to pick him up, take him back into the uh, into the lobby area, stood him in front of two pictures. One of them was Jesus holding a little lamb, and he would say to him, "Jimmy, you're a little lamb, just like that in the in the Good Shepherd's hands." And then he would take him to a picture of Jesus standing outside the United Nations, you know, knocking on the building. And he says, you know, Jesus is knocking on your heart, too. Someday you're going to open the door and let Jesus into your heart. Well, as it turns out, uh, Jimmy grew up, became a pastor, and in time that man transferred from Oklahoma to Colorado Springs, and that man is in the church of that pastor. So little did he know, but that tiny little boy that he was encouraging, someday you'll give your life to Christ, is now his pastor. Yeah, I, I sometimes worry, though, because we, we lead such private lives, and sometimes we're so hesitant to get involved in people's lives or, or in the lives of their children. You know, for obvious reasons, we have to be careful, but uh, but yep. there are needs that need to be met. There are, and I it is very rare for you to sensitively help a child without the parents uh, being grateful for that. Mm-hmm. And by the way, in the book I point out, sometimes the way to help a child through a difficult time is to do something kind for the caregiver. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I remember one time, I think I, I think the story is in the book, one time I was getting my car washed, and next to me on the bench waiting for the car to come out of the chute was a mother and her little three-year-old boy, and uh, they were talking back and forth with the most amazing conversation, like best friends. And uh, when when their car came was done first, and when she stood up to go to her car, I said, excuse me, ma'am, but can I just tell you uh, what a beautiful job you're doing as a mother to that little boy? I listened to that conversation. He is so lucky to have you as his mom. And she says, well, well, thank you. And she walked off to her car. But when she got to her car, she stopped for a second. Then she turned around and she came back to me and she said, can I give you a hug? <laughs> she said, I am, nobody has ever said that to me, and I'm trying so hard to be a good mother. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I just blessed that little boy, too. The power of a word in season. We can do this. We can all do this. <laughs> and that's really what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create a tidal wave of a grassroots movement of people who are grateful for those who bless them and now are alert to passing the blessing on. What would you like to see happen in the hearts of people who read this book? Uh, first of all, I would love for them to just take the time to go back and be a little boy, a little girl again, uh, relive what it felt like for that person to support you and to encourage you, and just thank God for them. And then, like I said, uh, contact them if you can. Tell them what they did. Uh, but then I want I want people to see children through the same lenses that I do. Uh, you know, I wear a Mickey Mouse watch. Uh, you know, I lead this <laughs> this worldwide ministry, and I wear a Mickey Mouse watch, and I do it for two reasons. One of them, so I don't take myself too seriously. Right. But the second is, uh, anytime I see what time it is, I'm reminded that my mission is children. And so I look up from my watch and I say, is there any child in the room that I can possibly do something to lift up right now? Hmm. And if there is, if it's nothing but a wave across the room, uh, I will do it. And if there's no children, well, then I just breathe a prayer for children. Hmm. Somehow I think that's what Jesus was like with kids. Well, you know what? 
uh, yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Wayne, because, you know, there's one time you really get a clear picture, uh, and that's in Matthew chapter 18 and ultimately chapter 19, where Jesus blesses the little children. The thing that's really cool about that was Jesus was a big shot. He was a big rabbi, and yet these kids were there ready to come to him. They must have known that if I can get close enough to this big guy and I hold up my arms, he'll pick me up. (laughs) Because eventually when Jesus was kind of scolding his disciples, because they were saying, children, would you go away? Remember? Mm -hmm. What he says is, let them come. Of such is my kingdom. He doesn't say, bring them to me. He says, just let them come. If you don't hinder them, they will come. And I hope that's the kind of person all of us are. When children look at us, they know that's a safe person. That's a person that cares about me. Uh, If I go to that person, uh, they'll give me a hug. They'll give me some affirmation. I I want especially God's people to be those kind of people. As we do that, we can absolutely transform the next generation. Always encouraged to talk with you, Wes. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, how God has uh, formed you and shaped you and given you the heart that he has. You inspire us. You really do. We throw around that word inspirational book. This really is an inspirational book, I think. I don't think anyone should read this book and then go on just be no. the same. No, we we can all so. do this. <laughs> Actually, yeah. when I make the point, none of us need one more day of training. We are all <laughs> experts when it comes to childhood. We spent 18 years doing it. We should all get honorary doctorates <laughs> for having done field research. We can all do this if we will, and that's my prayer. And it takes just a minute. It takes just a minute. Which is the title of this book from West Stafford, In the Heart of a Child, One Moment Can Last Forever. Now available from Oasis Audio as an audio book and in print from Moody Publishers. Thank you, Wes. My privilege. I hope everybody enjoys this book. And come on, let's, let's, let's change the world. For Oasis Audio, I'm Wayne Shepherd.